Welcome to ID the Future. I'm Casey Luskin, broadcasting with Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington. Today we have on the show with us Dr. Robert Marks, who is a distinguished professor of electrical and computer engineering at Baylor University. He's a fellow of the IEEE and also a fellow of the Optical Society of America. He's also a wonderful person to talk to about the debate over Darwinian evolution and intelligent design. He's one of the co-founders of the Evolutionary Informatics Lab with William Dembski. So, Dr. Marks, thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. Oh, it'll be a lot of fun. Now, the last time we had you on the show, Dr. Marks, I was kicking myself because we got you into a lot of trouble. Some folks at your employer, actually, were not very pleased that you were talking about a lab that was being run at Baylor University that was investigating problems with evolution, and that sort of got you into some trouble. I'm going to refer our listeners to go watch the documentary Expelled if they want to hear about this story. I don't want to make you talk about it, but I just want to say we appreciate you coming back on the show with us today. And I hope that this does not cause you to come into any more difficulties in your career. Oh, I don't think so, but I guess we'll find out. Okay, we'll find out. Well, <laughs> you're, you're the kind of guy, I love that attitude, just, you know, run right into the rain of bullets without thinking about it. We need more people like that, Dr. Mark, okay. so thank you. Well, thank you. So let's talk about a paper that you published in the journal Biocomplexity at the end of last year titled Active Information in Metabiology. Before we want to get into this paper, however, I want to talk a little bit about some of the background that led to you writing this paper. The paper is a critique of the ideas of an Argentine-American mathematician named Gregory Chaitin. Chaitin is, by all accounts, a genius and a brilliant mathematician who's made a lot of important contributions, but he has written about the topic of the evolution of life in recent years, and he's interested in some of these questions, and you found yourself at a conference with him a few years ago where you were actually critiquing some of his ideas but you didn't realize it. So maybe could you tell us the story of what happened at this conference and what happened when you were hearing him talk about his ideas on the evolution of life? Well, I first met Gregory Chaitin through reading about his research and some of his developments. He was one of the co-founders of so-called Komogorov chaitin solomonov information theory. It's one of those hyphenated areas that more than one person contributed to the foundation, independent of the other ones. And the guy was a genius because he actually started doing this when he was in high school in the Bronx, and he was a teenager. He published while he was still in his teens. One of the things that I read in a book was about something called Chaitin's Number. In fact, the book that I read, a classic book on information theory, called it Chaitin's Mystical Magical Number. And that is not something you read in dry, mathematically-oriented textbooks in information theory. So I read it and I started to just digest it. I was invited to a workshop where I heard a talk on Chaitin's number. And I had just started looking into it. I didn't understand it all, but it seemed really, really great because it was indeed Chaitin's mystical, magical number. And at the end of the presentation, I asked the speaker, I said, Chaitin's number is the same independent of the computer language you're using. He said, well, no, it changes from computer language to computer language. I disagreed. And he says, well, I think you're wrong. And then we left it and some other questions were asked. So later on, I was talking to a friend and I said, you know, this Chaitin's number is just astonishing. When I explain it to you, it will just blow your mind what it is capable of doing. And I said, I would love to get inside the mind of Gregory Chaitin. I would love to see what a genius of this caliber was doing when he came up with this concept. And my friend's eyes got big and he said, well, you're kidding, right? I said, no, I'm not kidding. He said, that speaker at the conference, that was Gregory Chaitin. So my breath was taken away because I realized that I had just listened to a talk by Gregory Chaitin and at the end challenged him about Chaitin's number and told him he was wrong. So needless to say, it was a little bit embarrassing. So that's how I first met Gregory Chaitin. That's almost like trying to tell Einstein about relativity or something it like really that. It really is, yes. I'm sure that was an honest and innocent mistake. Now, from what I understand, however, some of the discussions that you had at this conference and sparked some ideas in your mind, and that led you and some of your colleagues at the Evolutionary Information lab to write a paper on some of Chayton's ideas about the evolution of life. And before we get into the paper, maybe we should commend Gregory Chayton, at least from what you've told me, 
he was a real gentleman. When you wrote this paper that was sort of critiquing some of his ideas, he actually gave you a very fair review, and you really felt like he was quite a gentlemanly scholar in the way he handled that. Would you mind enlightening us a little bit about what happened there? Well, absolutely. It turns out that at a later time, I had an audience with Dr. Chaitin, and we began to talk about his work, which at that time I had digested. I tried not to ask him any embarrassing questions, but he had come up with this theory, which he said was really one of the first steps to prove Darwinian evolution. One of the things I like about Chaitin is his honesty. In his book, he says, the honor of mathematics requires us to come up with a mathematical theory of evolution and either prove Darwin was wrong or right. And I read this in his book, and I went, yes, this is really, really great, because he's honest about it. And I think that's what we've been doing at the Evolutionary Information Lab. We've been looking at the mathematics and showing that, indeed, the mathematics does not support undirected Darwinian evolution. So anyway, at our meeting, we talked about a little bit. I had some concerns, but he was using some really elaborate mathematics. And I thought, well, you know, always listen. And he uh, wonderfully volunteered to send me a preprint of his book, an electronic preprint. And he said, when the book comes out, I will send you a copy of the book also. He did so. And that allowed us to take a look at his book and critique its contents. That's really a nice story, Dr. Marks. And I appreciate you commending those people who are you are in academic dialogue with. So let's talk about this paper that you published in Biocomplexity last year with Winston Ewart and William Damsky. The title of the paper is Active Information in Metabiology, and it's discussing Chaitin's concept of metabiology. And it's interesting because Chaitin describes metabiology. He calls it a quote-unquote answer to David Berlinski's, and these are Chaitin's words, what, what he calls David Berlinski's stinging critique of Darwinism in Berlinski's book, The Devil's Delusion. Now, of course, Chaitin thinks that he can respond to Berlinski's critique and show that Darwinian evolution can produce new complex features. So first off, could you maybe just give us a little description of what is metabiology? Metabiology is using the tools of algorithmic information theory, a field co-founded by Chaitin, to model a Darwinian sort of search. And that's the basic idea. When we looked into this problem, my suspicions were confirmed that Chaitin's model was using the same source of knowledge that we had seen in other papers purporting to demonstrate evolution, talking specifically about the papers of Vita and EV. And one of the things that happens in evolutionary computing is that many times the programmer is numbed by familiarity. They don't realize that they're actually putting in the source of information. In Schneider's EV, he used something called a halting oracle. And as you might expect, a halting oracle, an oracle of any kind, is a source of knowledge. And that source of knowledge can be mined for active information. Schneider used, again, something called a Hamming oracle, which is something which exists, and he mined it to generate the active information that allowed the evolutionary process to work. Chaitin, on the other hand, used something called a halting oracle. Now, the halting oracle has the disadvantage that it doesn't exist. Alan Turing, in some of his famous work in the founding of computers, actually showed that the halting problem was not possible. It wasn't possible for a computer to analyze itself, to analyze another program, to determine whether that program halted or not. Chaitin actually assumed that he had this halting oracle, as opposed to a simple Hamming oracle. And to his credit, he actually recognized in his book that this was the source of information. And I'm going to quote here, now I have to tell you about the oracle. He was referring to the halting oracle, which is where all the creativity is really coming from in our model. So he recognized this was the source of information, and without this source, his program couldn't work. So this was the source of algorithmic information. We, meaning my co-authors, Dr. Ewart and Dr. Dembski, actually gave a parallel comparison between the simple Hamming oracle and the more sophisticated halting oracle model of Chaitin and put them side by side, and the comparisons are just really remarkable. They go right down the line. Obviously, the fact that the halting oracle doesn't exist is a bit of a problem for 
any model that relies on it to explain how Darwinian evolution can produce new complex features. But are there other ways that you would say metabiology diverges from biological reality? Does it properly model the Darwinian process? Well, first of all, one has to realize that algorithmic information theory is just astonishing. It's jaw-dropping. It's more fun than any of the science fiction I ever read as a kid. There are things in there in the field of algorithmic information theory that we can show, for example, mathematically exist but are unknown knowable. Chaitin's number turns out to be such an example. And Chaitin used a number of these ideas, assuming the unknowable was knowable. Uh, He used something called busy beaver numbers, which are so large that they're non-computable. And he used halting oracles, which we know doesn't exist. So he was working in a very surreal environment of this world of algorithmic information theory. And the math is beautiful. But whether or not it relates to reality is undisputable. It doesn't relate to reality because these things don't exist. That's where he was working at. That was his world in the area of of metabiology. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but it was sort of my understanding that in the real world, obviously, probabilistic resources are limited. Time is finite. Populations have finite sizes. And that imposes limits on what traits can evolve, especially when a trait maybe requires multiple mutations. You're going to need potentially a lot of time or a big population size in order to get all those mutations in one organism to produce that trait and to give that advantage. And obviously, metabiology uses a population of one single digital organism, which then evolves over time. But it's my understanding that through this halting oracle and through the algorithm that it uses, it essentially grants itself infinite computing resources to accomplish this evolution. And if it has all those infinite resources, then of course, with such a generous endowment, I mean, anything is going to be able to evolve, but we don't live in an unlimited world. And so would you say that metabiology avoids some of the limits on probabilistic resources in a very different way, obviously, than biology works, but in that general sense, it doesn't function like biological evolution really would function? Yeah, absolutely. The computational requirements, both in terms of memory and time, are just enormous in metabiology. I would correct you, though, in that there is a difference between infinite resources and unbounded resources. And metabiology assumes unbounded resources. That is, you can get as big as you want, but as big as you want is still far from infinite. One of the things that Dr. Hewitt did was actually implement Chaitin's metabiology on a computer. And it turns out all of Chaitin's results were asymptotic in the sense that this process had been working for a very, very, very long time and we had reached steady state. The transient, the first part of the evolution was what Winston was able to simulate and he showed that the results there weren't so good. If they continued, they would eventually reach Chaitin's asymptotic results, but the amount of time was just incredible. It's something that we just don't have the time for. The age of the universe is not old enough to contain the required computations. One of the conclusions you guys make in your paper is that metabiology is a lot like some of these other algorithms. And I know you alluded already to Avita and Ev, which are some of the other programs that your evolutionary informatics lab team has looked at and essentially uses active information. I know we've talked about this issue on ID the Future before, but for some of our listeners that may not remember, what is active information and why does it point to the need for intelligent design to solve a problem rather than an unguided evolutionary process? Well, the idea actually goes back to Bill Demsky's book entitled No Free Lunch, which shows that remarkably, if one is doing a search and designing something, then one search or one process is on average as good as any other process if you have no idea about the problem you're solving. In other words, that the search is undirected, that it's blind search. There's a great movie, Weird Al Yankovic, where they have two guys sitting on a park bench and one of them's blind and he has a Rubik cube and he twists it and he shows it to the guy next to him and he says, is this it? And the guy says, no. And so he twists it again and he shows it and he says, is this it? And the guy says, no. That's an example of a blind search. And without information to guide you where you want to go, one search is as good as another search, which on the average is as good as blind search. 
By the way, I believe that movie is UHF, which happens to be one of my favorite movies. Oh, UHF, yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of a stupid movie, Casey, but you enjoy it. Oh, well, I love stupid movies. I won't even go down the list of stupid movies that I like, but that, <laughs> okay. it, it is a great movie. Anyway. Well, I will mention that one of the things we did before we published the paper in Biocomplexity is I felt compelled to send Dr. Chayton a preprint of our review in the paper that appeared in Biocomplexity. And I did. And he responded, and he was just, again, as you mentioned at the beginning, just a consummate gentleman. He thanked us for allowing him to look at it. He did make some corrections. We had some small errors in it, and we were able to correct them. And he complimented us on contrasting his halting oracle and the hamming oracle. And he said that he really liked the fact that we simulated metabiology on a computer, referring to Winston's effort. Then he ended the email with, thanks very much for taking the trouble to write such a thoughtful analysis. He asked then to be sent the final version and let him know where it was published. And then he would, said he would like to distribute it to his students at the university where he teaches. So that was, again, the response of a true gentleman. And I wish that all of the interactions of those involved in this debate were done at this level of congeniality. That is a true model of the way dialogue and debate is supposed to happen, and that's really encouraging to hear, Dr. Marks. Well, we appreciate the work that you're doing and the papers that you're publishing, analyzing many of these evolutionary algorithms and asking whether they support a Darwinian view of life or an intelligent design-based view of life. So, Dr. Marks, thanks for what you're doing, and thanks for coming on the show with us today. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Casey. I'm Casey Luskin with ID the Future. Thanks for listening. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. ID the Future is copyright Discovery Institute 2014. For more information, visit www.intelligentdesign.org or www.idthefuture.com.